Go ahead and take out your Bibles and something you can take notes with this morning. Open up to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We are going to be uh, talking about Sabbath this morning. Talking about Sabbath. Some of you get excited about that. Some of you don't. But we're doing it either way. Uh, so Hebrews chapter 4, and you may be thinking, Andrew, we just spent 13 weeks going through every chapter in Hebrews, to which I would say, yes, you're right, we did. Way to pay attention. And that was a great time. And I was originally supposed to preach Hebrews chapter 4 in that series and then wasn't able to. So now's my turn to share that message. I knew it would come up someday, and today is that day. So I'll go ahead and open up to Hebrews chapter 4. Sabbath is something that I've been observing in uh, my own life. I'm starting to hear more about it. I'm hearing more of you talk about it. There's been lots of different conversations happening around church between different ones of you or talking to me. And in the last couple of years, it's been something that I've been hearing more discussion around in kind of pastor circles that I run in in my own little world. So I've just, my ears have realized in the last few years, this is a word and a conversation that I'm hearing more in my little world than I used to. So that may or may not be true for you. You maybe have been thinking about this more. Maybe you haven't. I'm just sharing my heart, you know. It's just something I've been hearing about more recently. So I've, in these conversations, it's been interesting to me. Some other things I've, I've observed as I've been hearing these conversations or been asking, asked different questions in the midst of all of those, I, I've had Sabbath recommended to me in the last couple of years more than I did in the first, like, 30 years of my life combined. It's been recommended to me. I've had books recommended to me. I've had quotes told to me. I've been told by different people what their favorite thing to do on Sabbath is or a Shabbat dinner that they participated in and how cool that was and how they really want to implement something of that into their own life. And that's all been really great. But one thing, again, I've just observed in these conversations in the last couple of years is that, to be honest, as I've been a part of these conversations and I've been told more about Sabbath and recommending more things telling me about Sabbath, I don't know, honestly, that I've had anybody in my own little world tell me or talk to me about what the Bible says about Sabbath. So that's not a judgment. It's just like an observation I've had. That's interesting. So books are great. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Quotes are great. Things that you learn from a Shabbat dinner or a Jewish culture is awesome. All those things are good. But the Bible does talk about Sabbath. And that's encouraging. That means that when it comes to our understanding and practice of Sabbath, that we can learn from other people and we can learn from experiences. We can uh, experience or experiment with different practices and all of that. But we have to have the Word of God as our foundation. Maybe a better way to say that is we get to have the Word of God as our foundation. So today, I'm not aiming to preach a message that covers everything about Sabbath. And this is not even going to be a very practical message. I meant to grab something for a really powerful illustration right now. So you're just going to have to use your beautiful imaginations. And I want you to imagine a brick. This message is a brick. It is not an umbrella. This message is supposed to be a brick, a foundation for you to build on to get the, the cornerstones of what the Bible teaches in place, and then you get to build on that, this is not an umbrella that covers everything you are and are not to do on Sabbath, through Sabbath, about Sabbath, around it. I will not say everything there is to say. That's why there's great books, beautiful quotes, and other people to learn from. Does that make sense? So this is totally one of those messages where uh, it's like, well... Don't give me all the concepts, like put it into practice for me so I know what you're doing. But don't tell me what to do. Right. <laughs> Heather was telling me apparently that's a big fat Greek wedding quote. Some an aunt or something says, tell me what to do, but don't tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> and Sabbath is definitely one of those messages. So that's on you, not on me. I've told it out from the front. I'm not telling you everything to do. So the point is, what does God say about this? What does God teach about this? And how can then you take those things and put that as the cornerstone and then you get to walk with the Lord and building upon that, but keeping the main thing the main thing. 
I hope that makes sense. We stand for the reading of the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4. Keeping up with the uh, Hebrews series we did, we got to read the whole chapter. Right. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still stands, <clears throat> praise the Lord. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us. So this is all, everything you're about to hear about Sabbath, it's good news. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith, by faith with those who listened. So the writer in Hebrews is speaking to Christians, early Christians, and he's tying things back to the Old Testament and things that the Old Testament speaks about the Israelites and he's starting to connect some dots here, some Old Covenant, New Covenant stuff. If you have more questions, there's a 13-week series on Hebrews that'll get you started. <laughs> Verse 3, for we have, uh, for we who have believed, everybody say, we who have, we who have. say, believed. believed. We who have believed enter that rest. So we enter the rest by believing. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. If you have questions about all this, you just got to read the whole Old Testament. Yeah. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, speaking of God, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Okay, so we enter by belief. We don't enter by disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. Today. Okay. We've got the seventh day. We've got a certain day. And we've got today. Saying through David, so long afterward in the words already quoted, today... If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Speak, Lord. I'm listening. For if Joshua had given them rest, I mean, we're covering the whole Old Testament here, aren't we? We got David, Moses, we got all kinds of stuff going on. Okay. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest. For the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. I love it. Seventh day, that day, today, a certain day, later on, and now we have rest that we strive to enter so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So, you know, all those things you think you're hiding from God sometimes, you're just not. No matter how hard you, I, we try... So let's just go ahead and talk to him about it. Verse 14, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Praise the Lord for your word. We stand on your promise, God, and we believe that your, God, that your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Come and do that in us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take a seat. <clears throat> We've got a lot to cover, so 
you need your notes out and you're going to need to write some things down. My goal here on the first bit of this message is uh, I may go a little quick. I may cover some things broadly, jot them down so you can study them in your own time. This is not going to be a comprehensive study, like I said, but hopefully this will. If you want to dig in more into what the Bible says about some of this stuff, hopefully I'm about to kind of give you an outline that you'll pick up on as we go. So make sure you've got that. I want to start with a zoomed out view of the whole. And that's a good Bible study tool, isn't it? When you want to know what the Bible teaches about something, don't just look at one verse about that thing. Let's look at what the Bible says about that thing. Zoom out, look at the whole, and that's how you're going to hear God a little bit more clearly. So let's do that very, very briefly with Sabbath. Genesis 2, verses 1, uh, chapter, uh, Genesis 1 and 2, we get the story of creation, and it says this in Genesis 2, verse 3, God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So very early on in the Bible and very early on in existence, like kind of during creation, we get are introduced to this holy day, this seventh day, this Sabbath day concept, this day where God rested. And that's interesting. We need to understand that God put rest into the order of creation. This is something that you could call natural law. This is just part of, part of God's law that he baked into creation is that life needs rest. Rest wasn't after creation was done. This is the seventh day. It's part of the whole deal. So God puts rest into the natural order and the natural law of creation. And then God underscores, as we continue to read the Bible, he underscores and codifies this natural law into his divine law. So he takes what is already true, what is already a part of what is re, a part of reality, and in that sense, it's a law that he established in creation, and he codifies it with words into his divine law when he puts it as the fourth of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verses 8 and 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, to keep it holy. So Genesis 2, verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Exodus 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So this is interesting. We've got it, we've got it established in natural law. God codifies it in his divine law. And really, it's good to understand that that's really what the Ten Commandments are. God is not establishing new rules in the Ten Commandments. The things that are in the Ten Commandments weren't okay before God said that they were the Ten Commandments. Right? Oh. So this is why the Ten Commandments are still, like, foundational for all of our life. Because this, God is speaking to what is already true about the order of everything he created. So that's encouraging to know. This is why we, we still keep the Ten Commandments and why they're still good and they've always been good. Okay, I'm not going to get sidetracked here. We're going to stay focused. Okay, so Exodus 20, we get divine law in the fourth of the Ten Commandments. So this begins to show us that the Sabbath day isn't just a day off. Okay, so what are we learning about this day that God is a little bit obsessed with? It's a day that is created by God, okay? It's blessed by God, and it's holy unto God. Interesting. I mean, which of the other days did God explicitly declare holy? That's fascinating. Not the day he created the ocean or the sun and the moon and the stars, not even us. This day he does nothing, this resting thing, God calls it holy. <clears throat> so we're introduced to Genesis 2, underscored in Exodus 20, and then we get some more oomph behind this whole thing in Exodus 31, verses 12 through 17. God has been giving the law to Moses for chapters 
including Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments that we just read. And when we, you get to Exodus 31, expands on this Sabbath reality in 31 verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all. Wow. Wow. Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. Okay, this is strong language from the Lord. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations <coughs> that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. We love those verses in the Bible. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Holy to us and holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death, just in case you weren't clear the first time I said that. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant. What's that word? Forever. It is a sign. There it is. Forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Okay, Sabbath is a big deal to God. Like, terrifyingly huge deal. Above all, yikes. Okay, so from the beginning, the Sabbath is holy. It's one of the Ten Commandments, and you get the death penalty if you break it. You might get the death penalty twice, depending on how you read Exodus 31. <laughs> why? Okay, so that's the what, but why? Why? Why is God so worked up about this day? Well, Exodus 31, 13 tells us. The Lord says this. This is the why behind God's obsession, in a sense, with the Sabbath. You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. Why? For this, this Sabbath is a sign between me and and you and all generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. God is very intent on the Sabbath being holy because it is a sign between you and me and every generation and God that he sanctifies us that he cares for us, that he protects us, that he provides us, provides for us, that he perfects us. Beginning in Genesis at the creation narrative, we see that Sabbath, this truth that it is God alone who sanctifies us, it is baked into creation, it is codified into his law, and it is all about God's grace. He said, I put one whole day in this creation thing just as a reminder between me and you from the beginning, not once Jesus came, from the very beginning. That there's nothing you can ever do or will ever do that will sanctify yourself. You have to have my grace and I have given it to you freely. Oh, God likes his good news. <laughs> Righteousness has always been a gift of God's grace. We, we, we have to understand this. It has never been a com about accomplishment of man's works. God's people have always been marked by faith. No one has ever received the righteousness of God because of their works, their ethnicity, or their geography. It's always been by grace through faith. It's always been by grace through faith. All of God's law points to God's grace. There's zero smiles in the room when I said that. No, 
Nikki, I see that smile. Thank you. All of God's laws point to God's grace. (laughs) That's really encouraging. Every rule that God has made points you to his grace. The law of Sabbath points to God's grace. I love it. On this seventh day, you know, if it mattered if it was Saturday or Sunday or Wednesday, he would have said on Saturday or on Sunday or on Wednesday. He says this day, a certain day, later on, today, that day, you will rest from all your works and it will force you to remember that everything you have is from God. It will force you to remember <laughs> Woo! When you're doing nothing for God, He sanctifies you. You will rest from all your work. You will remember that He is the creator of everything and everyone. And He isn't just big enough to create everything in seven days. He's big enough to create it all in six days and then have one day to just sit there and be restful and refreshed. You will rest from all your work on this seventh day, and you will remember grace. Yes, I am here as a human. I am made in God's image. I have an assignment, and I am here to work alongside with God in his kingdom, but I am not God. My assignment is not to be God. He is God. I need him. Everybody in my life needs him. And all of the nations need him. He is our father in heaven. Holy is his name. That's the message that God gives about Sabbath all the way from the beginning. And then God comes and he reveals himself to us in Jesus Christ as a man who lives on earth in the middle of the Jewish culture with lots of laws around this Sabbath day, and he lives on Sabbath days. How convenient for God to show us in the flesh how we are to interact with his holy day. (laughs) Matthew chapter 12. Verses 1 through 8, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to Jesus, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read? Okay, so here we get God saying you'll die if you do work. And then here we have Jesus, who is God, sort of looks like he's doing work on Sabbath. Okay. Verse number three, he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and he ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Something greater than the bread of the presence is here. Something greater than the house of God is here. Something greater than the law is here. Something greater than the priests is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In Mark's account of this story, in chapter 2 of the Gospel of Mark, in verse 27, it adds this, And Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus exposes that the people had made the Sabbath about the rules, about the bread, about the table, about the temple, about the priests. But Jesus, God, the Lord of the Sabbath reorients them by reminding them that man was not made to follow rules. The rules were made to remind man of God's grace. Because all of God's rules point to his grace. The physical Sabbath day was created for man. Man was not created for the physical day of Sabbath. And the physical Sabbath day was created for man to remember God and remember God's mercy. Wow. 
But wait, there's more. God and his mercy, his sanctification, is not for one day a week. Thank you, Beth. God and his mercy, his sanctification, is not for one day a week. Mm. God and his mercy, his sanctification, is not for one day a week. How are we getting somewhere, people? It is a whole new reality to be born into. God's grace is not for the seventh day or that certain day or some far off day later on. Oh, oh, this is good news. This is, this is, this is good news. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 says the promise of entering his rest still stands. In verse 7, he says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do you hear his voice or do you just hear an empty rule? Do you hear his voice? Do you hear him calling you in every rule that he's given? Do you hear him calling you closer? Do you hear him bringing you into his grace? I don't think you do. And I don't know how much I do either. And the reason I know that is because when I've been saying three or four times already that every one of God's rules points to his grace, we're all giving that. If we knew it, we'd say, yeah, that's so true. Right? That's exciting. There's like, let's dig into that, huh? So if when I said that, you went this, oh, dive in. With me, because I need it. Okay, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest. Okay, let's, let's, let's Bible study here. For if Joshua had given them rest. What is, who is Joshua? Well, there's a lot there, but just he, he represents. Uh, so for if Joshua, meaning if the law that Moses handed down through Joshua had given them rest. Okay, so we've got the law represented in Joshua. We also have the promised land represented in Joshua because, right, the law was given to Moses, but Moses didn't enter the promised land. Joshua took them into the promised land. These are kind of two huge deals, right? God's law and the promised land. Like, if you've read the Old Testament, kind of central topics here. And he says right here, for if the law or the promised land or Moses or Joshua or ethnicity or geography had given them rest... God would not have spoken of another day later on. Yes, there is more than just, this is more than just a physical day. Because when this was written and there was the whole Joshua thing going on, there was already seven days in the week. Right? So apparently that day was pointing to some other day. Is it the eighth day? We don't, what, what, what day is this? Yes, there is a physical day. We do have seven days in our week, but there is more. There has always been a a spiritual day that the physical day has always been pointing to. Verse 9, so then there remains a Sabbath rest. I love that. Not a Sabbath day. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered, what's that say? God's rest, not your rest on the seventh day. Who is it? Who, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter God's rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Okay, so they didn't enter into God's rest because of disobedience. But what did that earlier verse in verse 4 tell us? How do we enter in? By keeping the seventh day holy? By entering into the promised land? Believing. Okay. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Okay. Yes, I want want to strive to enter that rest. That sounds awesome. I'm just going to assume you're with me on that. We've read chapter 4 and we're here and we're like, come on, tell me. How do I strive to enter that rest of God? 
I want that. How do I enter the spiritual reality of resting from my works and being perfected by God's mercy? I want to do that. The next verse tells us how. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of our heart. Go listen to Bo's message from our Hebrew series for more on that. How do we enter into the rest of God? His word. And who is his word? It's church. There we go. I knew you all could get that one. Like Bo said months ago, and like Crystal talked about last week, how do we enter into his rest? By getting on the operating table and letting Jesus Christ, the living word of God, pierce and divide and sort out and sanctify us surgically. Dividing between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, thoughts and intention, mercifully convicting us by this Holy Spirit, bringing us into a lifestyle of repentance where we don't just die and go to heaven someday, but we have turned around and we walk in step with the Spirit, abiding in Jesus Christ, participating in the eternal kingdom of God that we might be sanctified by the Lord. By keeping the rules? No. No. By the Lord. Verse 14 goes on. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus. How do we enter the rest? How do we pass through the heavens? How do we get sanctified? How do we be holy as God is holy? How do we keep all the rules we cannot keep? How do we be righteous as we are demanded to be righteous? By the great high priest who has pierced through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So what work do I do? Hold fast to that confession. (laughs) Believe. (sighs) Verse 3, for we who have believed, for we who have held fast to the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, that it is the Lord who sanctifies us, enter into his rest. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Who was a man tempted to live by his own works. He even faced that temptation. To do it all himself. To do all of God's will on his own. But instead, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. He made himself nothing. And he made himself obedient. To death, even to death on a cross. He was the Lord of the Sabbath. He was mastered by the Sabbath, because he is the Sabbath. If this was during the Hebrews series, the title of the message would be, Who is Jesus? He is the Sabbath. He is the Sabbath. He is the day. He is the mercy. He is the grace. He is the word. Let us then with confidence, verse 16, draw near to the throne of keeping the Sabbath day, to the throne of never breaking a rule. Let us draw near to the throne of making God happy because we finally pulled it all off. No, let us draw near, my friends, with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And we don't just need help on the seventh day. We need his help every day. So, pastor, do I have to keep the Sabbath or not? If I don't keep the Sabbath, will I die? Yes. You will. Because Jesus is the Sabbath. 
And if you do not keep the Sabbath, you die. If you are not saved by grace and born again, you will die in your sin if you do not believe and fall away by disobedience. If you harden your heart as you hear his voice calling you today, you will die in the disobedience of unbelief, and that is the unforgivable sin. That is the spiritual truth and reality of the Sabbath. In typical Jesus fashion, he took what we thought was the rule and he takes it up a whole nother level. Okay, pastor, so do I have to keep the Sabbath? (laughs) Physically speaking, You do not receive the death penalty if you don't keep the Sabbath. And the crowd went crazy. (laughs) Because the Sabbath day was always pointing to a certain day. Another day later on. You are saved by grace, not by keeping the Sabbath. But keeping the Sabbath is one way that you live saved. Exodus 31. This is a sign between... Me and you and all generations. Not that it is the I, the Lord, that saves you and gets you to heaven. It is I, the Lord, who sanctifies you. What is sanctification? Sanctification is the journey of learning how to live saved. You get born again, you are a saint, but you don't really know how to live like one yet. So sanctification, you have already been saved. All your sins are forgiven. You have been made new. The old is gone, the new has come, but somehow this old man that you crucified, you keep picking it back up again. Okay, I'm not going to get sidetracked. Oh, my gosh. I knew this was going to happen. It is a... Okay, so no, you don't have to keep the physical day of Sabbath to be saved, but it will sanctify you. It is a spiritual discipline, and that's what spiritual disciplines are. They are you physically participating in the sanctification of God. When you fast, when you pray, when you come to church, when you obey the word of the Lord, when you do the Sabbath day according to how God designed it, you will grow in God. So do you have to? Wrong question. Wrong question. So so all of this to say, many people think that the Sabbath is just about resting or doing refreshing things or kind of pleasurable things or doing fun things. And, And that's all great and good. And I hope you do those things, but those aren't necessarily Sabbath. Sabbath and rest are not the same thing, even though they may overlap. Sabbath and refreshment, Sabbath and hobbies, they're not all the same thing. Even though when you Sabbath, you may experience these things. The brick that God lays for Sabbath is remembering that it is the Lord who sanctifies you. So you can take a nap just because you want one, and that's awesome. And you can also take a nap and as an act of remembering, oh, I am so weak. I can't even make it through a whole day. And it's the Lord who sanctifies me. Not doing laundry isn't necessarily Sabbath. Not doing laundry and remembering restfully. Lord, look at that. The world's still spinning. Am I right? The person who calls you on that day and who needs something from you. They need your help because it's an emergency right here, right now, today. Because everything always is whenever they call. And you say, no, not today. Even though you love pleasing people. And it's good to serve them, right? But you need to remember you're not God. (laughs) And they need God just like you do. And I am remembering that it is the Lord who sanctifies me. He he divides me from all of the things that I produce and accomplish and connect myself to to make me impressive to him and to other people and to myself. And I have to confess. I have to hold fast to this confession. I'm not God. He is. And I need him. And so does everybody else. He divides between your thoughts and intentions. 
Why are you doing what you're doing? Bone and marrow, soul and spirit, surgical. I hope that when you do a Sabbath day, you get rest and refreshed because that is the Lord. And when you do, let that be his grace. You know, all those things you're not doing right now that you're stressed out about because you're going to have to do them tomorrow and you don't know how you're going to get to that. Just, I'm big enough for that. Big enough for you to sit there and worry about tomorrow, tomorrow and have the world keep spinning in the midst of all of it. So how do you keep the Sabbath? It's kind of for you to build on. What are all the things that you do to accomplish and produce and connect and connect yourself to and identify with and build yourself up in? Stop it. And remember that it's the Lord who sanctifies you. It's the Lord who sanctifies you. I don't know what to do with the fact that this is taking too long, so we'll just maybe not do a song again, sorry. I'm going to take an extra few minutes here because I can't tell you what to do, but I want you to have enough building materials to walk out of here with. So I'll just share personally a little bit. Here I go. Here's the quotes that I love about Sabbath. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but this has been a journey for me over the last handful of years. I used to, do, I used to consider Mondays my Sabbath, you know, because it's like after Sunday and my job, I do this on Sundays and all that sort of thing. And then I just realized that, frankly, Monday was just a crash day. And I was just tired. And I was just taking a day. It was just a day off, which is great. And I still take Mondays off, praise the Lord. But I was like, this, I'm not, like, remembering God. I'm just kind of zonked and saying no to everything. <laughs> so... I'm not prescribing this for anybody. You see, it's, okay, so I noticed that was going on in me. I'm not engaging with the brick. I'm not building on the brick. This is just my day off. So I moved it to Saturdays at the beginning of this year, which was a big step of faith for me because there's some sermon refinement that tries to happen on Saturday. There's some things that happen on Saturdays. There's a lot of yard work to be done on Sabbath, on Saturdays. There's a lot going on there, but it was like, I just felt the invitation of the Lord that it was like, nope, that's actually the day where disconnecting would actually be disconnecting. Every, nobody needs anything from me on Mondays. You know what I'm saying? Like, Mondays cost me nothing. So for me, I had to engage the sanctification. I had to, and I needed to. And so I was like, all right, Lord, Saturdays will be my Sabbath day. I won't, work on, I won't accomplish or produce anything. I'm not going to work on my sermon. I'm not going to do yard work. So now Mondays are my responsibility days. And Sunday, Saturdays are just Sabbath. And I know I'm doing Sabbath right if I get into a bad mood. <laughs> if I get antsy and I'm all angsty. Because once you stop, you start seeing everything you need to do. <laughs> and that's the point. That's the point. Every single one of those things. Lord, I'm not God. Watch. I'm not going to do that thing and the world's going to be just fine. And God doesn't need to remember that. This guy does. It's a day oriented around my family, spending time with my family and disengaging from the production because that's where I go. I, I'm, where, that's where I get my sanctification, that's where I get my uh, impressiveness from. Not really to impress God and frankly not even to impress you, but really to impress myself. This is about, uh, I had somebody just tell me this last week. They said, I told him, well, when I do Sabbath, I get in a bad mood. He said, yeah, that's because it brings you into a house of mirrors and you see every angle. I was like, bro. First of all, back off. <laughs> Second of all, that is so true. <laughs> so for me, it's the production thing. For you, it might be the people-pleasing thing. It might be something else. 
And that doesn't mean that every Sabbath day also always has to be angsty. Hopefully I'm, I'm maturing and I'm growing in this and now I know, okay, that's coming tomorrow. Lord, I'm gonna surrender it now. Did you see? Oh, it's like all of a sudden I'm thinking about Jesus more. Praise the Lord. And I engage just with the family and, and things like that. And we turn on the relational centers of my brain instead of just the production centers where I impress myself with them. And I get to enjoy the Lord. And every little thing that needs to get done is a reminder of Jesus. It's a reminder of the grace of God. And that sounds so nice. But at first, it's pretty angsty. Like, ooh, I do. Mm. Yeah. And what it does is it reminds me. It's like, whoa. Well, God, if I, if I can't get it all done on this day, I don't have time all the other six days to get it done, and I can't do all of it. And he's like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. God says, I, I know. You need to remember. It's me who sanctifies you. You and all generations. It is I, the Lord. So do you have to keep the Sabbath? To grow? Probably. Some form or fashion, you do need to build on this. Apparently, God thought it important enough to bake it into the natural law of the entire universe. So you probably aren't the one person <laughs> who can just do this every day. You don't report to me? I'm just saying. You live your life, man. What you, but participate in the sanctification of God. That's, that's, my, that's when my go-to phrase, whenever the, my things come up. I'm like, okay, I'm participating in God's sanctification of me. Right now, he is clearly pointing out how much I need to control the whole entire world. And I'm remembering right now, he's dividing that out of my brain and my soul and even sometimes my body. He is cutting me off from that burden that tries to drain my soul. He is cutting me off from that lie of the enemy that I have agreed with that is actually trying to steal from me, kill me, and destroy me. He is surgically sanctifying me. So I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to remember Jesus. But then I'm going to need more grace tomorrow to get it done. Exactly. So now I'm not just doing it in my own strength. Because I'm so amped up and wired. I can work seven days a week and I'll be fine and I don't need naps and I got this taken care of. And God's like, it's not about you. Praise the Lord. All right. We got to be done now. I think that's enough building material. <clears throat> I'm going to pray for us. And I'm going to have some of our prayer team over to the side. If you need prayer, come get prayer before you leave. And I just encourage you. Step into the grace of God. Build on this. I'm not going to be calling you to check on if you're doing this or not. Just go in the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your Sabbath rest. We pray that you would teach us how to strive to enter into it. That I pray grace over everything that we've talked about this morning. I know that this is a thing where we can get so legalistic and wrapped up in all of those sort of things. Lord, I pray that your word would wash us and purify us and build us up. And would you send us out in the power of the Holy Spirit? Bring us into your sanctification. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Have an incredible week. And in the grace of God, love you so much.